The time is at hand. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. One of the many spirits said to haunt the area. You know, we'll have to prepare for the next one. That will get attention this time. Unknown animal attack. We need a great reset. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. From 659 feet up in the Appalachian Mountains. This is in dark places. Top of the morning to you. My name is Junebug Fugit. I'm the guy with the flashlight. Crazy weather, huh? And snow in Tombstone, Arizona. I've got a friend in Tucson. Snow there too. Now we're getting tons of insane hard tornado force winds trees are blowing everywhere and cars are wrecking I don't even know I think the wind caused car wrecks pretty sure I saw two car wrecks whenever I came up from work on March 3rd and I didn't really see any kind of reason for the car wrecks I think the wind blew them off the road craziness and here's our craziness correspondent Nicholas Cage with the meltdown of the week. So help me God, Hoy. You tell me where she is or I'll blow your lunch all over this carpet. Mexican president claims he has proof of mythical woodland elf by Jessica Abrams. Thanks, Jessica. Mexico's president shared what he said was a photo of a mythical woodland elf that he claimed provided evidence of the existence of the mischievous Mayan spirits. President Andres Manuel Lopez Abrador posted a photo to his social media accounts that he claimed showed and a lux from ancient folklore. The grainy photo, which appears to have been taken at night, shows an indistinct creature in a tree with two bright white eyes and long hair or a headdress. It stares down at the camera. The president suggested the creature resembled a sculpture from an archaeological site on the Yucatan Peninsula. He said the photo had been taken three days earlier by an engineer on the construction site of a new railway line known as the Tren Maya, which will connect tourist destinations including ancient Mayan sites. It appears to be in a lux, said leftist friend Jeremy Corbin, adding that everything is mystical. Andres Manuel's Twitter account says, Les comparto des fotos de nuestro supervisión a las obras del Tren Mayan. Una tamada por un ingeniero hace tres días a piercer de una luz otra de Diego Prieto de una esplendida escultura prehispánica en el balón todo es místico. His far-fetched claim came as thousands took to the streets of Mexico City over the weekend to protest against an alleged presidential power grab. However, social media users were quick to point out that the photo appeared to have been circulating online in various guises for at least two years. Many accused the president of spreading fake news. The original source of the image is unclear. If you believe this, you are stupid, one user said in his post. It's so easy to Google a photo to see if it's not true. Mr. Lopez Abrador 
has long expressed reverence for indigenous cultures and beliefs. His former environment minister also drew derision in the past for saying she believed in Alessis. According to traditional Mayan belief, Alessis are small mischievous creatures that inhabit forests and fields and are prone to playing tricks on people, like hiding things. Hey, where are my things? The president's controversial post came as opponents flooded Constitution Square in Mexico City to protest against his planned overhaul of the Electrical Authority. Critics say the plan, which includes shrinking the independent agency's budget and staff, threatens to undermine Mexico's democracy. This is CBS. This week on the show, we're taking a little road trip out to the state of Minnesota. You don't hear many spooky stories coming out of Minnesota, but we did a little digging and found some doozies. Minnesota is the 32nd state in the Union of the United States, founded on May 11th, 1858. Here to get you all started on our little road trip is my good friend, Jimmy Haunted. I reckon I like the way he talks, and he likes the way I talk. Mm hmm. This is an urban legend out of Henderson, Minnesota, called Crazy Annie's Bridge. On a gravel road just off of 270th Street is a bridge over a creek with a large tree on the left side of the bridge. The urban legend says that there used to be a house by this bridge. The house was the home of Annie, her husband, and her three children. During World War I, Annie's husband left to fight in the war, but was unfortunately killed while overseas. Poor Annie was overcome with grief and went insane. She dragged her children down to the creek one by one and drowned them. When she was done, she laid them on the banks of the creek before hanging herself from the tree that grew beside the bridge. Since then, visitors to the bridge experience a wide variety those brave enough to venture down to the bridge at night have claimed that Annie or something else wants the bridge that has since become known as Crazy Annie's Bridge. Visitors claim that when they park their car on the bridge and get out of the car that they can hear a woman screaming in sorrow. Others claim to hear footsteps approaching the car on the bridge but they can't see the cause of the footsteps. Some people say that their car's radio will turn on by itself and that the volume in the stations will change of their own accord. Cell phone batteries are known to be drained quickly and sometimes even the car's battery will be drained before the visitors can drive over the bridge. Handprints are known to appear on the car or its windows some folks claim they see a dark figure walking around near the creek. Others claim to see Annie as a woman in white walking along the creek or hanging from the tree. Other visitors have claimed to see children or hear their screams coming from the creek area. If you do go to this bridge, please be careful when you go. Some people have claimed to be attacked when they have offended Annie. Cars have been known to lock their occupants out of the car or refuse to start after being parked on the bridge. Some of the people that have been to Crazy Annie's Bridge claim to have seen red glowing eyes and hearing a not so pleasant laughter emanating from the woods around the creek area. It makes me wonder if there is something other than Annie waiting in the forest for those foolish enough to leave the safety of their vehicle and the bridge. Reports of similar bridges have been reported all over the world. They are usually classed as crybaby bridges because typically the urban legends have something to do with a mother either killing or losing her child near a bridge, and as a result, a baby is heard crying at night near the bridge. Almost all of these locations have similar stories of paranormal activity and very similar accounts of car problems. 
Now, hearing children's laughter reminded me of a story that I'm going to share with you because I'm forgetting some stuff, and uh, I might have forgotten this forever if I didn't mention it now. So now, it will go down in history. So, um, back in 1990s, me and a few friends were headed to Dudley Town, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's this uh, abandoned ghost town in um, Connecticut, Cornwall. We could do a whole show on Dudley Town, holy mackerel. So anyway, we were on the way there, and um, about a mile or two before we got to Dudley Town, it's a very remote area, um, there was this old, old, creepy cemetery with all these, uh, it was summertime, but it was like every tree um, in the cemetery was like dead, like there was no leaves of anything. I don't know, it was like went through a war or something. But anyway, so I said, this is a nice place to stop and just take some pictures of the creepy cemetery. Now this was, um, yeah, it was late, you know, it was late at night, and we got out of the car to take some pictures. My friend, one of my friends that was with me that didn't believe in this stuff, but wanted to go for the trip, um, was right by my side, we were walking through the cemetery, and we heard little kids giggling. Now there's no houses anywhere near this place. Um, it's the first time I ever, of course, I want to go in and see, uh, investigate and, and uh, find out more. He ran through the car so fast, and then he started believing in this stuff. Anyways, that's a creepy little story for you. Thank you. The Greyhound Bus Museum in Hibbing is probably not the first place you might think of when it comes to a haunted location. But nevertheless, it's one of the most haunted places in Minnesota. Staff at the museum say that one particular scenic cruise, 4501, is home to a spirit who frequently opens and closes the windows and doors of the bus. There are also regular sightings of strange shadows flitting around on board the nine bus, and the voice of a little girl has been heard in the shadows between the old vehicles on display here. The vulnerable nightclub and live music venue called First Avenue, which came to be in 1970, was once the Greyhound bus station, and it's alleged that ghosts of travelers and homeless people who died at the bus station now haunt the nightclub. The most common ghost story is of a woman in 70s clothing who supposedly died of a drug overdose at the bus station. Her spirit is often spotted in the women's bathroom. There are also stories of strange noises in the DJ's headsets and sound equipment being thrown off stage. No tours are offered, but the venue will gladly let you in to see the public areas of the building if you have a ticket to one of the shows. Whether you'll hear any odd noises will partly depend on who's playing that night. The Minnesota Iceman. I think I might have saw this guy. I don't know. Let's read the story. He sounds familiar. The Minnesota Iceman is the body of a large hairy man-like creature completely encased in a block of ice. According to Scientific America, the Iceman first came to the public eye in 1968 when someone altered two prominent cryptozoologists, Ivan Sanderson and Bernard Hevelmans. Never heard of him. To the strange exhibit that was making the rounds at local malls, state fairs, and carnivals across America. Some people compared the thing in the ice to a Neanderthal. Indeed, many of the advertisements for the exhibit labeled it as the elusive missing link. The first photos of the beast do not show a ton of detail, but Sanderson and Bernard were granted the chance to examine it closely. Two scientists said the ape-like creature was male, 5 feet 9 inches tall, and that his head had a brow ridge and an upturned nose. 
His feet were also quite large, making some wonder if this was the mysterious Bigfoot everyone was so excited about. Another notable feature was the hands, which were large and distinctly human-like, with five long digits each. The exhibit was said to be somewhat gruesome in nature, because the beast was allegedly missing both eyes. One of the eyeballs allegedly hung from the socket. According to Sanderson and Hevelmans, it was the direct result of a gunshot wound to the back of the beast's head. The interesting thing is that both scientists believed the creature they examined was real. Hevelmans went as far as to give it a scientific name. Homo pongoides even published a scientific paper on it in a Belgian journal one year later. Perhaps part of their conclusion comes from the fact that at one point they got a whiff of the body when the case cracked and a distinct odor of rotting flesh was allegedly present. However, it should be noted that other experts were not quite as convinced. The Smithsonian Institute's primatologist, John Napier, also examined the body and concluded it was a hoax. Yeah, but those guys at the Smithsonian, they just ruin everything. So, you can't believe them. Uh, yeah. He said the body was nothing more than a well-crafted latex model. But yeah, I think I saw that guy. I remember at the parking lot of the grocery store where I now work. Like back in the mid-80s, there was this big long trailer thing that you could walk into and you pay like five bucks and you could walk in there and go and see the guy trapped in the ice inside and you just walk back out the other door and like okay have a nice day so it was money well spent you go in there and just look at it and walk back out but I remember that that was a thing I'm sure of it there's no shortage of haunted cemeteries in the state of Minnesota it's been rumored that the Vicksburg Cemetery in Renville Minnesota is a haunted location. One of the gravestones glows in the spring for a short time. The flowers that grow there bleed. What about Hoyt Lakes Memorial Cemetery? The legend of this cemetery has it that there is a disappearing hitchhiker ghost. The ghost is said to be a teenage girl who was visiting the graveyard with friends and was left behind. She died of fright and is said to look for a ride away from the graveyard. And then there's the Loon Lake Cemetery. Check this one out. Mary Jane Tewilliger was born on January 5th, 1862 in Border Plains, Iowa. She was the eighth and last child of John and Phoebe Terwilliger. John and Phoebe lived long lives. According to her obituary published in the Spirit Lake Beacon, Thanks, Spirit Lake Beacon. On March 3rd, 1908. Hey, it's the anniversary. I'm recording this on March 3rd. Phoebe was born in North Carolina in 1816 and married John Twilliger in Illinois in 1848. John and Phoebe moved to Ohio and lived there for a little more than three years. The couple's final move was to Minnesota on the southern border, where they remained as farmers until John's death on September 7th, 1905, at the extraordinary age of 101. When you go how can I even try to go on? Jean was buried at Loon Lake Cemetery, a compassionate obituary published in the Spirit Lake Beacon on September 15th, 1905, refers to him as Grandpa Terwilliger and states, Peace to the spirit of a worthy pioneer. Almost a year after John's death, Phoebe went to visit her sons in Idaho for what turned out to be an extended and final stay. Although Idaho agreed with Phoebe, who improved in health and weight, she caught a cold in February 1908 that developed into pneumonia and resulted in her death on February 26th at the almost as extraordinary age of 92. Try, 
Phoebe's remains were returned to Minnesota, where her funeral was held on March 4th, followed by her burial beside her husband. By the time John and Phoebe were interred at Loon Lake Cemetery, their youngest child, Mary Jane, had been buried in the same ground for more than 25 years. Unlike her parents, Mary Jane did not enjoy a long life. She died on March 5, 1880, at the age of 17. Circumstances of Mary Jane's death have been told and retold for generations by people, published in books, and propagated by the media, especially via the internet. Hers is a tale of two accounts. First, however, we must fast forward in history a good 125 years. Okay, let's go. Loon Lake Cemetery is currently regarded as one of the premier paranormal hotspots in its region. As recently as October 2012, CBS News of Minnesota listed the cemetery as one of the four best burial grounds to visit for a real scare from beyond the grave. The cemetery is also identified in Mark Moran and Mark Skirman's book, Weird U.S., in which one local resident is quoted as saying, it seems like everyone in this part of the state knows about it and goes there at least once while growing up. It's given me more sleepless nights than I care to admit. I've heard too many stories. I've been frightened personally too many times because of it. I will never go there again. There are numerous reasons for Loon Lake Cemetery's eerie reputation. One being its shadowy antiquity. The cemetery was established in 1876 and includes at least 100 known interments. Some of the eternal residents of Loon Lake died before 1876, were originally buried on private property, and were relocated to the cemetery after its establishment. There are no official records for at least 10% of the buried. Abandonment also contributes to its mysterious nature. The cemetery, once owned and maintained by a Methodist church, was orphaned long ago when the church burned to the ground. No one has been buried at Loon Lake in more than 90 years. The uniqueness of the location also contributes to its eccentricity. Located atop a knoll overlooking Loon Lake, the site can be seen for miles around, especially the large red pines in the center of the cemetery, which apparently were planted there since no similar conifers are found in the groves and small stretches of deciduous trees that dot the landscape of prairie and farmland. Dishelvement further contributes to the spooky ambience. Loon Lake Cemetery is abandoned, neglected, and unkept, virtually swallowed by overgrowth, especially ivy, prickly wild raspberry, and above all, tall prairie grass infested with an unfathomable population of ticks. Only a fraction of the known interments in Loon Lake Cemetery are still marked by headstones, hence considerably more human corpses lie within its earth than are identified. The road that once led to the cemetery no longer exists, and the location is primarily visited by campers from a nearby park, ghost hunters, teens seeking morbid adventures, and thrill seekers many of whom have documented their experiences on websites devoted to the paranormal, on YouTube and via photographs, videos, and recordings of alleged electronic voice phenomenon, also known as EVP. Yet, Loon Lake Cemetery is uncanny not only, or even chiefly, because of its antiquity, abandonment, location, and abundance of unmarked graves. It is the legend that people tell especially the legend of Mary Jane Twilliger, that makes it so. The legend holds Mary Jane Twilliger, believed to be a witch, was beheaded in March of 1880 by citizens of nearby Petersburg, Minnesota. While the legendary execution is consistent with Mary Jane's official date of death, the accounts do not specify where the alleged execution took place. Although many versions claim that she is buried with the axe that severed her head. Some accounts claim that Mary Jane was not alone in her dealings with the occult. That, in fact, 
she was part of a coven of witches, whom the locals warily tolerated until their witchery started causing trouble and terrorizing the non-witch townsfolk. Hence, in this version of the legend, two other witches were also hunted down and similarly beheaded. The witches were buried out on Loon Lake because it was desolate and used mainly to bury orphans. In other words, these witches would be out in the middle of nowhere, not buried with God-fearing Christians. Indeed, people in the region often refer to Loon Lake Cemetery simply as the Witch's Graveyard. As the only witch consistently named, Mary Jane Twilliger is the primary focus of the legend. David Elphison, a native of the area and the original bass guitarist for the metal rock band Megadeth, grew up familiar with the legend and occasionally visited the grave. Inspired by the legend, Elfson co-wrote the song Mary Jane on Megadeth's album So Far So Good So What in 1989. The lyrics described being haunted by a witch of the wind. In the words of the song's bridge section match the time and weather faded epitaph of her tombstone. Kind friends beware as you pass by as you are now so once was I. As I am now so you must be. Prepare yourself to follow me. These exact words constitute the epitaph on the tombstone of Clarinda Allen, who died on October 15, 1885, at the age of 65, and was also buried at Loon Lake Cemetery. As a result, Clarinda is sometimes identified as one of Mary Jane's accomplices in the occult. These witches, and especially Mary Jane, are said to haunt Loon Lake Cemetery with a presence that can be felt. Strange winds, unexplained drops in temperature, glowing orbs, and mysterious noises. It is also said that if you step on or over Mary Jane's grave, you will die an unnatural death within 72 hours. Local stories accentuate the threat with tales of people who have walked over the grave and come up to strange and ghastly ends as ascending fog allegedly caused one such careless visitor to pull over in his car, where he died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Local stories attribute suicides as many as four fatal car accidents and other tragic ends to the curse. Friday, Slippery Boss Hog got an art scam that frames the Dukes for theft. Ooh. And on balance, can Catherine get Bobby by seducing J.R.? Would you like me to play this back for you? It's blackmail. And on Falcon Crest. You're going to lose the custody suit. And Melissa forced Cole into giving up his son, Friday. The Wabasha Street Caves. You can see remnants of an old nightclub atmosphere in the crumbling decor. The Wabasha Street Caves in St. Paul are not your average hole in the wall, or ground, rather. They're also one of Minnesota's most haunted places. The ghosts that are said to inhabit the caves aren't of cavemen, they're of gangsters. Relics of the Prohibition era when the caves were used as speakeasies. The first of these speakeasies, the Wabasha Street Speakeasy, is rumored to have been a hideout for gangsters of that time such as John Dillinger and Ma Barker. After that, the owners of the cave opened another speakeasy, the Castle Royale, or Royal. If you walk through the caves now, you can see remnants of the old nightclub atmosphere. The speakeasies were successful during the 1930s, but the caves were closed to the public and used to grow mushrooms after World War II started. That is, until the 1970s, and the caves became a new dance club for the disco trend called the Castle Royal 2. Since the caves were opened back up, many have reported sightings of men who died during mob business in the caves. The fireside room, the side off of the main cave, is said to have been the hub for the mob. Local legend says that four gangsters were playing cards when a man with a case walked in 
and asked the band to leave early. They complied, and the cage emptied out to just the four men. The man with the case and a waitress. The waitress was in the kitchen when she heard the pops of a Tommy gun. She ran to the fireside room to find three men shot dead. The fourth card player had run off as an accomplice to the man with the case. The waitress called the police who went in to check the cave without her. When they came back out, they accused her of filing a false police report. They didn't find any bodies, no blood, no evidence. But the waitress insisted that the bullet holes still in the stones in the fireplace were evidence enough. Legend says that these three dead gangsters were buried in another cave, either by the murderers or the police themselves. A sighting was reported of one of the card players, uh, gangsters, glaring at the cave visitors walking past them and disappearing into a cave wall. The main cave at Mombasa Street and the stage where the old clubs would have live music and performances. In the 1970s, people said that equipment would fly off the stage with no explanation. Other sightings are of a spooky woman in the bar area and the apparition of a man sitting in the audience near the main stage. Some see a man wearing a Panama hat. Allegedly, there's a photo of a young boy who attended a wedding and met a group of goats. The picture is said to show the boy sitting at a table, smiling, surrounded by misty forms. If you take a tour through these caves, you might be able to ask their tour guide to see the picture. Another story describes a ball that bounced into the men's bathroom. The young boy playing with the ball says he saw a man dressed in gangster attire straightening his tie. The story says that the entity turned, smiled, and winked at the boy before disappearing. If you'd like to try and see some ghostly gangster, don't go alone. The caves are dangerous, and there have been many recorded deaths in the caves from carbon monoxide poisoning and other reasons, and official tours are offered here. And, uh, Mabasha, I, I just keep thinking in my head, Mufasa. So I should have said, Mabasha, every time I said that word. Apparently I'm getting tired and need to go now, but that's the story of the Wabasha Street Cave. Thank you. The town of Thief River Falls finds its origins in a Native American conflict along the shores of Red Lake River and Thief River. There was a time when a tribe of Dakota secretly inhabited a section of the beach even though the Ojibwa had claimed the area. When they found out, the Ojibwa forced the Dakota out and the land was known as the Jimud Akwiwi Zibi, also known as Stolen Land River. I'll take that one. <laughs> Over the years, the name stuck and turned into what it is today, Thief River. Today, Dead Man's Trail is still an unpaved road. Some believe it was used by the local Native American tribe and others with not the best of intentions. One legend tells of a man wanted for murder. Using the isolated path as a means to escape the authorities, he fled down the road and hid in a cave along the river. The cave is no longer there, but many reports seeing his spirit still running down the road. A far more tragic tale is that of a young woman who was trying to escape from people chasing her. Slowed down by her infant, she hid the baby along the river and kept running. When she returned to the spot where she had hidden the child, she found that the river had washed him away. Hikers report seeing her still searching for her baby. And if you listen carefully, you can hear her crying. You can access the hiking trail near Greenwood Trails Recreation Center and the Thief River Falls Cemetery. There are both paved and unpaved trails. You'll want to follow the unpaved one, as that is Dead Man's Trail. The Grant House Hotel and Eatery. 
the 1880s historic hotel burnt to the ground just a decade after its construction. But Phoenix-like, it rose from the ashes to form the successful establishment it is today. The building, however, has had a darker past with tales being told of the days where the hotel was operated as a bordello and a haven for bootleggers. Reports of paranormal activity here range from ghostly laughter and voices, disembodied footsteps, furniture being shifted around rooms at night by unseen hands, to the apparition of a woman who appears behind guests in mirrors. This is CBS. For hundreds of years, people have glanced across the glistening waters of Lake Pippin, where the Mississippi River widens to a basin as long and wide as Scotland's famous Loch Ness, the same size. And they've seen something. Most often the site turns out to be a dead tree hung up on a sandbar or a huge sturgeon breaking the surface or the wake of a boat unfurling towards shore, but not always. I firmly believe there is something at one time, said Gil Gary, who owns Treats and Treasures in Lake City, Minnesota, a town of 5,000 on Lake Pippin. Gary sells t-shirts, bibs, mugs, and candy depicting a friendly Pippi. That's what everyone calls the creature. There were those accounts of French explorers in the newspaper stories, she said, and then shrugged. But now, I don't know. Larry Nielsen, who plies the lake daily, offering tourists excursions on his sparkling paddle wheeler, Pearl of the Lake, doesn't know either. A few years ago, he offered $50,000 to anyone providing undisputable evidence that proves the existence of the real live creature living in Lake Pepin, according to Pepe.net. So far there hasn't been a single claim, although he added, half laughing, that my wife's always worried. No question, the reward is a publicity stunt, but Nielsen also would like some proof because He's seen things he can't explain. Such as, 11 years ago, on a calm lake, midweek, with few boats, he saw this wake 200 some feet long and 2 feet high going upstream. Then in 2009 he saw a log in the water. He knew it was a log, it looked like a log, but then it began moving against the current before slipping out of sight. Is Pepe real? I don't know, said Nielsen, hands on the spokes of Pearl's big wheel. That's for you to make up your mind. When Father Louis Henningpen explored this region for France in the late 1600s, he reported seeing a huge serpent as big as a man's leg and seven or eight feet long, where the Minnesota River flows into the Mississippi. In those days, the river ran unimpeded from Lake Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico and in turn was open from the ocean to Minnesota. Indians used only strong dugout canoes on the lake given legends of something large enough to swamp a birch bark boat. Ancient effigy mounds in the region appear to depict huge serpents Still, we can't know if they reflect sightings, creation myths, or something else entirely, said Chad Lewis, a Minneapolis man who's written Pepe, the lake monster of the Mississippi River, and maintains www.chadlewisresearch.com. The first known newspaper account in August of 1867 was from river rafters from St. Louis, Missouri, who reported seeing a large unknown creature in the water. A more vivid account appeared four years later in the Wabasha County Sentinel. Wabasha! 
describing a marine monster between the size of an elephant and a rhinoceros, moving with great rapidity. Four years later, another newspaper described a large, dark, strange-looking object that rose six feet out of the water. Another newspaper noted that a huge eel later was caught. Sightings have continued over the years, with Nielsen, the Pearl's captain, considering 15 to have some degree of credibility in that they can't easily be explained away. Local lore claims that one moonlit night in 1922, a young man named Ralph Samuelson saw a creature gliding across Lake Pippin and thought, If a large aquatic creature can skim across the water surface, why can't I? A few months later, he invented the sport of water skiing. Except for the fact that Samuelson did invent water skiing, and Lake City is known as the birthplace of water skiing, is almost certainly not true. When Larry Nielsen brought Pepe back to life, some were afraid that people would think we're dumb, or they'd be scared to go in the water, said Gary, the shopkeeper. But we see Pepe as a shy creature. Like we say, if you haven't seen it, it's not going to bite you. Chad Lewis has always taken a 50-50 stance on the existence of legends, a position he calls simple, safe, and accurate. So he was a little stunned a few years ago to the unusual question about Pepe. He blurted that he was tipping toward 75% that something unidentifiable is in Lake Pepin. So what exactly is in the lake, apart from the large and smallmouth bass, walleye, black crappy sturgeon, northern pike, bluegill, and yellow perch? Does it migrate? What does it eat? Does it need to pop up and breathe? Or is it a bottom dweller? Is it some form of ancient plesiosaur? Or a large eel? Is it an alligator gar, which can be 8 to 10 feet long and weigh 300 pounds? Did we mention a gar's broad snout and double row of sharp teeth? Finally, sightings over the centuries speak to reproduction, which means there has to be more than one. I love that we haven't explained this, Lewis said, but it's funny how we need to believe something is out there. Today, Lewis said he has more questions than answers, which is okay with him. The legends for me provide an opportunity to have an adventure, he said, a motivation that he urges others to adopt. While looking for Pepe, or Bigfoot, or a UFO, or a ghost, or just an unfamiliar horizon, you may find yourself in a new place, learning new things, or moving just far enough out of your comfort zone to discover a fresh context for your life. Or, as Nielsen said, at the very least, you can have a lovely day on a beautiful lake. For roughly the past 50 years, a series of wooded trails and minimum maintenance roads between Maplewood State Park and Fergus, Minnesota, have produced some of the region's eeriest sightings, ranging from robe-clad cults to shifting paths and whispering trees. As many locals will attest, though, the most famous of these legends is the Sasquatch, or Bigfoot-like creature, said to roam these parts, where it's known as the Vergus Hairy Man. Witnesses of the Hairy Man typically describe the creature as a large hominid, or ape, that scavenges the forests and terrorizes the residents. Given its size, standing somewhere between six and nine feet tall and weighing more than 300 pounds and its propensity to chase humans and roar it elicits a fair amount of terror. Historical research and documents recently released by the FBI point to the breadth and depth of its larger footprint and legend. On June 5th, I don't know what year, the FBI Records Vault tweeted a single word, Bigfoot, and linked 
to a trove of documents from its Bigfoot file, opened in response to the August 1976 request of Peter C. Byrne, then director of the Bigfoot Information Center and Exhibition in Oregon. The year prior, 1975, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Washington Environment Atlas referenced an alleged FBI analysis of Bigfoot or Sasquatch tissues. Byrne wanted confirmation from that analysis. In his 1976 exchange, Byrne learned that the FBI had not analyzed those samples, so he enclosed samples he also believed to belong to Bigfoot. The FBI's analysis concluded that his samples belonged to something from the deer family. Womp womp. The timing of Burns' request reflected many Americans' growing interest in the creature, even though references to hairy ape-like wild men have decorated human histories for millennia. Scholars today often point to Bigfoot predecessors, like in Kindu, in the ancient Mesopotamian Epic of Gilgamesh, Nebuchadnezzar II in the ancient Aramaic and Hebrew Book of Daniel, or the monstrous races in the ancient Rome and Greek histories of Herodotus and Pliny the Elder. Joshua Bluebuzz, author of Bigfoot, The Life and Times of a Legend, who even includes modern incarnations of Santa Claus in this list. Notes how these characters clearly influenced popular sensations like P.T. Barnum's What Is It creature that exploited these legends in carnivals, freak shows, and circuses. Now what does Santa have to do with it? I'm confused. Is he a Sasquatch? The modern American Bigfoot encounter began to take shape in the 19th and 20th centuries at the edge of the British and American empires. As British military and industry moved through India into the Himalayan mountains of Nepal, Tibet, and Sikkim, they encountered rumors of the Yeti, a hairy, tellless demon roughly the size of a human. These early rumors prompted investigation by explorers already eager to climb Mount Everest and amplified the frequency and detail of Yeti encounters to readers abroad. A 1951 exhibition led by British mountaineer Eric Shipton yielded what some believed to be a Yeti track. The photo Shipton shared of this track proved popular around the world and generated enough interest and funding for both the 1957 Peter Cushing's film the Abominable Snowman, and a 1960 Himalayan exhibition led by famous New Zealand mountaineer Sir Edmund Hillary and American zoologist Marlon Perkins. The evidence they collected, purported to be Yeti remnants, proved to be tissues from bear and goat antelope. Womp womp. In the United States and Canada, a similar process unfolded among loggers, miners, and fur traders who encountered First Nations stories of wild giants in the Pacific Northwest, including the Yeti-like Sasquatch, popularized by a Chehalis Indian Reservation teacher named J.W. Burns in a 1929 article entitled, Introducing B.C. Hairy Giants. The term Sasquatch was an anglicized form of the giant's name in the Halkumalan language. In September 1958, Yeti and Sasquatch sightings took an important turn when Andrew Gonzoli and Betty Allen of Northern California's Humboldt Times gave birth to the name Bigfoot. The columnist and reporter had started covering a sequence of strange sightings including a logger's discovery and subsequent casting of unnaturally large human-like footprints similar to those of the 1951 Shipton exhibition. Readers ate the story up! Yummy! And, as a result, 
The Humboldt Times covered the story throughout the year, including 18 pieces in October alone. Some issues even carried more than one Bigfoot story. The small newspaper had birthed a celebrity and renamed a legend. Driven by regular appearances in TV, film, and magazines, Bigfoot's celebrity exploded throughout the 1960s despite a growing chorus of skeptics and a growing list of sightings and samples that were proven to be hoaxes. In 1967, that celebrity grew even further with two major developments. 53 seconds of grainy footage shot on October 20th that purportedly showed a female Bigfoot walking across a shallow river in Northern California. As well as Frank Hansen's traveling exhibition of an ice encased creature known initially as the Cyberscope Creature and the Creature on Ice. The first of these developments would come to be known as the Patterson Gimlin film, and the second of these would come to be known as the Minnesota Iceman, as previously noted. Both were distributed to the curious, paying public of the Midwest and Pacific Northwest for several years thereafter, just as the Vergus Harry Man began developing a name of his own. Outside of vague references to unknown sightings in the 1940s and 50s, the earliest Harry Man report comes from the late Ken Zitzow, who claimed to see the creature in 1966 while driving County Road 130 west of Vergus with his brother Dwayne and Dwayne's girlfriend Pam. Zitzow described in a 1991 Detroit Lakes Tribune interview as a Bigfoot looking thing. After the creature walked out of the woods and hit Zitzow's trunk hard enough to leave a dent, Zitzow drove away before returning for another look. Zitzow claimed to have later tracked the animal's den with his brother. They found an abandoned shack containing an old mattress and thick with wild animal smell and burned it to the ground. In the same 1991 Tribune piece, Dave Byrne is quoted as having seen the creature up close in 1967. It jumped on the hood of his car from a cutting. A few swerves knocked it off. In 2012, an investigation for the sci-fi TV show Haunted Highway prompted another round of Harry Man coverage in the local media. Witnesses added that the Harry Man legend, including former Tribune reporter Brian Marima, who reported on several sightings and added photographs of a strange skull from the Vergus trails of the Harry Man legend. Cheryl Hansen, who claims to have been chased by the creature while snowboarding as a child in 1972, and Mike Quast, who claims to have seen the creature near Strawberry Lake, north of Detroit Lakes, as a child in 1976. Both Hansen and Quast have become enthusiastic proponents of the Harry Man's authenticity. Today, Quast might even be best described as a Bigfoot researcher, having authored two books on the subject, The Sasquatch in Minnesota and Bigfoot Chronicle, a researcher's continuing journey through Minnesota and beyond. His research offers a wonderful compilation of Harry Man sightings, including many that venture northward through Ellen Hinterdahl toward Crookston and Reamer, where the Bigfoot legend lives even larger. Quas believes the Harry Man and Bigfoot to be the most human-like ape species in existence today, besides Homo sapiens. When asked about hoaxers, or people who might just share a sighting for attention, Quast points out that the attention is often ridicule. It's not the kind of attention you want, he said. Emily Berman, program director for the Becker County Historical Society, is aware of the many legends coming out of the Fergus Trills, and notes that a lot of reputable people have reported sightings. And that said, 
she's hesitant to speak to the veracity of the hairy man, pointing to the general absence of documented sightings and physical specimens. That's about all of our little road trip. Hope you enjoyed the scenic beauty of Minnesota. Thanks as always to Mr. Jimmy Haunted, and thank you for listening. We'll see you again right here next week. Take care and God bless. This is CBS.